This video lecture brings us to our last philosopher for the course. We will talk about Kant's transcendental theory of imagination and perception. We'll see that Kant responds to the empiricist philosophers who preceded him, especially Hume, by offering a more complex but perhaps more explanatory theory of how imagination makes perception possible. In the last video, we looked at Hume's skepticism. We saw that Hume makes what I think is a very strong argument for why an empirical theory of perception leaves us with a major epistemological gap between our perceptions of objects and those objects themselves. Hume argued that the imagination plays a very large role in perception, larger than reason. On Hume's account, imagination is what gives us a conception of complex objects that persist in time and that causally interact with each other. Sensation alone can't give us that picture because sensation is too immediate. On Hume's view, the imagination, with the help of memory, comes in after the immediacy of sensation to connect up images that we can then reflect upon. Without that, we'd have no real perception and no real knowledge either. Just to review, because Kant is going to give us a very different picture, Hume understands the mind as taking in a bunch of simple impressions from the world. The memory takes a snapshot of those impressions as they originally appeared, and then the imagination links up the images in succession. Hume thinks the mind takes the jumble of sense data that we get through sensation and registers it first as simple impressions and then converts it to simple ideas. The mind associates those simple ideas successively, and this is what gives us a sense of time and space. That successive combination of images, then, gives us a sense of temporality, of causation, and of identity, meaning a sense that an object persists over time. So this is how we have ideas of substance, not from logic, and not strictly speaking from sensation either. Our idea of substance comes from the imagination's combining work. The imagination instinctively recognizes the commonality between a whole bunch of individual impressions and relates them together as all belonging to one persisting thing with multiple qualities. And this is what we call substance. With causality, a similar thing happens. The imagination links up a bunch of resembling images successively to give us a sense of an object's temporality. We learn this temporality from experience. We register from repeated experience that some things always precede other things. The mind then does this weird, inexplicable thing. It posits something that it has no genuine experience of. It posits a necessary connection between cause and effect, and it presumes something that it cannot see or feel. It posits a causal power that allows one thing to causally affect another. This must be a kind of fiction of the imagination, Hume says, because it is impossible that we can experience such a causal power or a necessary connection. This means that the imagination must be able to add something that is not available to experience. The mind itself then posits necessity, he creates the idea of universality when it does not and cannot experience such a thing. Why not? Because we can only experience particulars. It is impossible to experience that something is always the case in all circumstances. So for these reasons, Hume argues that sensation alone cannot give us a sense of persisting objects. Another problem with sensation with sen is that with sensation alone, we would not be able to distinguish perceptions from the objects themselves. We need reflection to do that, and reflection is a mental act that thinks about the sensations that are coming in 
through our physical sense organs. If there wasn't this kind of reflection, Hume says Hume, then we'd not be able to distinguish ourselves from the objects of sensation. But because we do have this reflective faculty, we're able to recognize not only that we are different from the objects, but also that our mental representations of the objects are distinct from the objects themselves. This is why the mind recognizes objects as having a kind of double existence. They exist out there in the world independently of us, and they also exist in us as mental representations that we can think about. But there's a major problem with this. Hume recognizes that there is no way, either by logic or by sensation, to causally connect our mental representations to the objects themselves. And this represents a major epistemological gap. We take it on faith that our mental representations are a direct result of the objects themselves. But there's actually no way to be certain about this. And this is why Hume is a skeptic, a title that he embraces. He calls for humility. He doesn't think that philosophers who value reason so much are actually entitled to the claims to certainty that they want so much. Hume thinks there is a limit to both reason and sensation, and that our knowledge is just not as solid as we arrogantly like to think that it is. So today we look at what Kant made of all this. He thought Hume was right, that that kind of skepticism is the logical result of an empirical view of perception. So what did Kant conclude? He concluded that empiricism, of the Lockean and Humean kind, must therefore be wrong. Effectively, Kant thinks that Hume and Locke are only part right. Their mistake is that they start the analysis of perception too late in the process by starting with sensation. We'll see that Kant, like Hume, thinks the imagination pl plays an, a critical role in perception. Kant also, also thinks, like Hume, that the imagination connects up images together. But he goes further than Hume. He goes further by saying that, yes, the imagination takes up the images taken in by sensation, but it doesn't start its work there. The imagination, says Kant, also has an a priori role. That is, the imagination is already hard at work before sensation. And this makes the imagination not just critical, but necessary. Necessary in the universal sense, that is, meaning that imagination has to do this in order to make experience even possible in the first place. Here's Kant. When he says psychologist in the following passage, he means empiricist theories like Locke's and Hume's that just looks at, the, what, the, at what the mind is doing at a non-metaphysical level. He writes, no psychologist, i.e. empiricists like Locke or Hume, has yet thought that the imagination is a necessary ingredient of perception itself. This is so partly because this faculty has been limited to reproduction, and partly because it has been believed that the senses do not merely afford us impressions, but also put them together and produce images of objects, for which, without doubt, something more than the receptivity of impressions is required, namely a function of the synthesis of them. Wait, you may be thinking, didn't we just learn that Hume says that the imagination is critical to perception? We saw that Hume actually spends a lot of time arguing that the imagination is the key ingredient in synthesizing and combining impressions together. But Kant's meaning here is very different than Hume's. Kant is raising that necessary component of imagination that I was just talking about. What Kant is saying is that what the empiricists are doing wrong 
is that they haven't recognized that the imagination has to come in before sensation, not just after it, in order for us to have experiences in the first place. So just to give you this as a visual, this is a simplified view of how empiricists like Locke and Hume understand perception. First you have sense impressions, then you have simple ideas, and then those simple ideas are combined to give us, a complex, to give us complex ideas. The imagination comes into it here, in between simple ideas and complex ideas. In the transition from simple ideas to complex ideas, the imagination creates new, more complex pictures. Or, at least that's a plausible understanding of Hume's copy thesis. If Rickless is right about what a simple idea is, Hume might have the imagination come into play early, bef uh, earlier in the process between sensory experience and sim to create simple ideas. Regardless, what's important for our understanding of Kant is that this scheme, or in this scheme, sensory experience comes first. On the Kantian scheme, on the other hand, imagination has a double appearance like this, with imagination coming in before sense experience and again after it. We'll discuss this at length later in the lecture. For now, it's enough to say that Kant's after experience role of the imagination is not incredibly different from the empiricist view though there are some significant distinctions that we'll get to. But what is really different is this pre-experience role for the imagination, and it is this that we'll be talking about for the rest of today's lecture. So Kant assigns both an a priori and an a posteriori role to the imagination. This is Kant's transcendental theory of the imagination. In order for this to make sense, we'll need to review Kant's trans transcendental theory of cognition. You may have already had some exposure to this in Phil 210. My goal here today is to give us an intuitive understanding of what Kant's main argument is. So I'm restricting my explanation just to the important bits and intentionally avoiding the heavy jargon and technical details as much as I can. So here's an important thing to keep in mind. I'll remind you a few times of this because it is especially easy to forget what Kant means by the word transcendental. He doesn't mean it in the kind of new agey way that you may have encountered elsewhere. For Kant, transcendental specifically refers to the mind's a priori functions that make experience possible. It's transcendental because it transcends the world of experience by connecting together the mind's a priori functions with its a posteriori functions. The way I like to make this more intuitive for students is to use the analogy of a computer. Now, this is just an analogy, meaning that it is a metaphor and not a literal interpretation of Kant's view. But I think that computers uh, and what, we are, what most of us are familiar with about how they work helps us to decipher what is otherwise very uh, abstract in Kant's thinking. So by analogy, we can compare Kant's conception of the a priori functions of the mind to a computer's operating system. And the a posteriori experience is like the data that you input into the computer. Just like a computer can't do anything with data unless it is furnished with coding first, i.e. that it has an operating system, so the mind can't do anything with experience unless it is furnished with, an, with a priori rules. Remember that Locke argued that the mind is a tabula rasa at birth? Locke was denying that the mind has anything in it before experience. Everything on the empiricist, or what Kant calls psychologist account, starts with experience. 
Hume agrees with Locke on that. There is no knowledge before experience, says Hume. That's why Hume's theory of causality is what it is. He finds that it's impossible to experience necessary causal connections, and that's why he concludes that this knowledge is, technically speaking, illegitimate, or rather added by some post-experiential faculty, like the imagination. Kant, however, does think that we have access to knowledge about universals and causation. Kant actually does think that Hume's argument from empiricist is sound, but he thinks the conclusion is wrong. That means that something must be wrong with the starting point. Kant says that since we do, not, since we do know about causality and universals, it means that empiricism must be wrong. Taking up our computer analogy, we know that a computer doesn't start with data. It starts with coding that has to be inputted first in order for the computer to be able to retain and make use of data. Applying this to the mind, it means that we likewise do not start tabula rasa and then take in data. Not precisely, anyway. The mind needs some rules first, some kind of program or code in order to take in the data. So, just like a computer, Kant isn't suggesting that we have any information before you put data in. What he's suggesting is that you have to have something in place, a programming structure with rules of operation, before the mind is going to be able to accept the data and know what to do with it. Now, remember that I'm giving us the computer as an analogy. It isn't a perfect comparison, but I think it works as a metaphor to compare the mind's a priori structure, as Kant describes it, to a computer's fundamental programming. Now, keep in mind that he nowhere ever says program. So when I use that word, remember that I mean it metaphorically. What does this programming look like? What does it need in order to work? It needs a few layers of rules and operational systems. The first important such operational system is that it requires that all our thoughts be recognized as unified in one single consciousness. And this makes sense, right? You need for your thoughts to be cognizable as all belonging to you as a consciousness thinking about things. Kant doesn't think that this comes from experience. It can't be. You wouldn't be able to have an experience in the first place if you didn't recognize that all these experiences are all your experiences. Now, one mistake students often make in thinking about the a priori is that they think about it chronologically by asking what a baby knows. That's a problematic way to make sense of the a priori. Of course, our thinking gets more sophisticated as we grow, and a baby is going to be confused about the distinction between themselves and their mother and the world around them. But that's not the kind of thing Kant is looking at. What Kant is saying is that in order for any experience of a baby or of an adult to make sense, there has to be a structural level awareness of the self in at least a very rudimentary way. Even if you don't yet have the cognitive skills to formulate a thought like, I am a thing that thinks and exists in the world of objects, what you have at a very, very basic programming level is a pre-experiential ability to unify your experiences as all being experienced by you as a single consciousness. Kant calls this the unity of apperception. One of the first and most basic things that our brain's operating system has to be able to do, again, by analogy, is store data in a single system that is unified and cohesive. Hume acknowledges this a little bit, but in a, an a posteriori, i.e. Po post-experience kind of way, when he says that sensation alone wouldn't allow you to distinguish yourself from the objects. 
Hume said that you have to have reflection that allows you to create distance between yourself and what you are experiencing. Kant agrees except that he thinks that this can't be awareness that comes from, re from reflection because that implies that it comes after the sensation has already been processed somehow. Kant says that this unified sense of self as the thing experiencing things has to already be there before sensation ever occurs. Kant maintains that it is a first and foremost requirement for any experience at all. So this is what the unity of apperception allows us to do. It's how we can, A, distinguish ourselves from our experiences as things happening to us, and B, unify all our experiences and thoughts as contained in one consciousness, our own. Again, to use our computer metaphor, our operating system needs to be pre-programmed to accept and synthesize data before it can be expected to perform other unifying operations on that data. So that programming code, again I mean metaphorically, is itself the rule of the unity of apperception. But Kant argues that the process by which the mind can perform that unifying operation at the programming level, is the imagination. Why the imagination? Because Kant, not unlike Hume in this respect, sees the imagination as the faculty responsible for unifying and synthesizing. Thus, the first job of the imagination is to be prepared to connect perceptions together in one unified consciousness. This doesn't happen after experience. It happens as a condition of experience. Now, obviously, if there are no experiences or perceptions, there's nothing to unify. But what the imagination does at an operational level is that it acts as a synthesizer for our thoughts so that we experience ourselves as one unified consciousness with multiple thoughts and ideas. Here's Kant explaining this. Now, if we wish to follow the inner ground of this connection of representations up to that point in which they must all come together in order first to obtain unity of cognition for all possible experience, then we must begin with pure apperception. In other words, he just said that if we want to make sense of how we have mental representations in the first place, we have to start with pure apperception, meaning an a priori level, a kind of a programming kind of self-awareness. He writes, All intuitions, i.e. sensation-based experiences, are nothing for us and do not in the least concern us if they cannot be taken up in consciousness whether they influence it directly or indirectly, and through this alone is cognition possible. Meaning that we couldn't have any kind of experience at all if it weren't for this unifying consciousness. It's what makes conscious awareness possible at all. So to reiterate, the mind takes up the world as exper of experience as representations. But first, in order to do that, it has to have the ability to hold and make sense of those representations. The first requirement of this is the unity of apperception. And here Kant is again emphasizing that you need an a priori awareness of self in order to have any kind of conscious awareness of anything else. He writes, all empirical consciousness then however, has a necessary relation to a transcendental consciousness preceding all particular experience, namely the consciousness of myself as original apperception. It is therefore absolutely necessary that in my cognition all consciousness belong to one consciousness of myself. <laughs> 
So this is not terribly different from Descartes, I think. Kant argues that you cannot learn about the I, or the self, from experience. It has to be a priori. Except that in Kant, it doesn't involve some kind of deep activity of reason to find that the I exists. For Kant, awareness of self is a predicate for experience itself. Now again, asking when it is that a baby acquires a sense of self is not really helpful in this sense. Kant isn't talking about uh, a kind of high-level thought, like it must be the case that I am a thing existing in this world and having thoughts. Babies obviously can't do that. He means that at a much more deep level, the brain is taking in information in a way that is unified into a single consciousness that maybe only later when it can, call, it can consciously call itself I or myself. What he means is that you can't register experience unless your brain can make sense of those experiences as happening to one unified experiencer, which you might later recognize as your own identity. So what is the imagination doing here then? It's making this sense of self possible because it is the faculty responsible for synthesizing all the aspects of your cognition into one single cohesive unity. Here's Kant. This synthetic, i.e. as in synthesis, unity, however, presupposes a synthesis or includes it. And if the former is to be necessary a priori, then the latter must also be a synthesis a priori. Thus, the transcendental unity of apperception is related to the pure synthesis of the imagination as an a priori condition of the possibility of all composition of the manifold in a cognition. Reminder on terminology. Remember that transcendental means the a priori conditions that make experience possible. The manifold is the whole gamut of information from the world that the mind has to synthesize to make sense of the world. Okay, so that was one part of the imagination's a priori job, but there's more. The brief section that I photocopied you to read is actually a critical juncture of the critique of pure reason. It's where Kant needs to explain how the a priori intuitions connect to the a priori concepts, meaning, in everyday language, how he addresses the problem Hume said was unrecon unreconcilable. Hume told us that it was impossible to tie our perceptions of objects to the objects themselves. Kant has a very detailed deduction to prove that you can. I don't have, or we don't have time for the full details of that argument, but we do get to cut straight to the answer. The answer is that Kant thinks the a priori imagination does this job. The imagination is what connects sensation to thought at an a priori level. Okay, back to the computer analogy. On Kant's view, our essential programming involves more than just the unity of apperception. It also includes what we might call two main programming compartments. There's, sensation, there's a sensation side, and there's a thinking side. Now, I'm using the word sensation, but Kant uses the word intuition to avoid making it sound like he's talking about an a, post a posteriori experience. On the sensation slash intuition side is where you get the programming structures needed to process information about the world. On that side, you again have two basic programming level requirements. All of our experience has to be processed as being one in time and two in space. That means that we have to experience things spatiotemporally. Again, this is part of our programming. It isn't necessarily the case that the universe itself conforms to our sense of 3D space and time as a four-dimensional universe. But 
And again, this is where our computer analogy is helpful. We can, metaphorically, say that the universe has, just has to be compatible with our operating system, such that our brains can process it as four-dimensional. And in this sense, we bring four-dimensionality to the table. Our minds actively process the data it receives from the world according to its pre-established specification that, for our brains to process the data, it has to be understandable in 3D space plus time. Space and time are effectively the rules that are applied to sensory experience. No matter what, we can only experience things this way. It's how our processing system receives data. Now, in the critique and in the prolegomena, Kant gives a long and careful series of proofs to back up those claims, and we just don't have time for that. I recommend, if you haven't already, taking the third year course that concentrates exclusively on the critique. What I'm giving you here is just the Coles Notes version to draw out the information that we need for Kant's theory of perception and imagination. So that was the sensation side of it. Now for the understanding side. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly because, that's, because what's important for us to know is that the imagination is what will connect these two sides. So what follows is just a snapshot of the understanding side, just the essentials. Time and space are the rules that have to be applied to experience. But Kant thinks that there are also a whole other set of rules that applies to how we think about experience. At its most basic, the Kantian rule for thinking is that our thoughts have to be in a logical format. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't think nonsense. By logical format, I mean something way more basic. These are effectively the basic programming rules, or like basic programming rules. Again, our com computer analogy helps us make this more intuitive. These, these rules are extremely fundamental. They are things like if P then Q, or something either is or is not, or something is either particular or universal. If you've had any exposure to computer coding, you may be familiar with the need for a basic coding language to be in place in order for the computer to execute commands. It's kind of like that. Kant calls this kind of rules-based coding language judgments. Effectively, it says that all our thoughts only make sense as propositions. Now, we don't have time to get into all the nitty-gritty about the categories. It's enough for us to know that they are the rules of thinking, and Kant thinks that they are exhaustive, meaning that every thought at, at a very basic, basic level is covered by these 12 pure concepts of the understanding. I have paraphrased the categories into everyday and more intuitive language. We don't need to have these memorized, but they are extremely useful for us in discovering why Kant thinks that he can do what Hume argued is impossible. This is how Kant says that we can recognize universals, including causality. And the imagination is a big part of it. So these are the basic rules, basic codes, that allow us to classify our concepts of things. All things are, one, universal, or particular, or a totality, meaning infinite. Two, all things are, either, there, or not there, or all over, all over like space is all over. All things are related by A, identity or substance, B, causal connection, or C, commonality. And all things are A, possible or impossible, exist or don't exist, and C, necessary or contingent, 
Again, that language is, per is paraphrased, but notice what this list has in it. It includes these ideas that Hume said had no good explanation. For example, universality, causality, identity or substance, and necessity. And this is part of how Kant corrects Hume's skepticism. Kant agrees with Hume that these are not possible to experience. But on the scheme that Kant is giving us, we don't need to experience these to understand and recognize them. So for Kant, things like necessity, causality, substance, universality, are not inexplicable fictions added by the imagination. But neither are they derived from experience. What these non-experienceable things are is part of our basic program. Again, speaking metaphorically, our brains are pre-programmed to recognize and categorize the world of experience in ways that include universality, infinity, and necessary connections, all things that we cannot possibly experience. So for Hume, these are created by the mind by an unconscious induction from the particular to the general. But for Kant, they are among the ways that our brains are capable of synthesizing data. Thus, the mind is able, a priori, to recognize these in nature. It can do it in mathematics because Kant thinks that math is a manipulation of our a priori intuitions of space and time. But it can also do it in nature with what Hume calls matters of fact by applying the categories which include universal rules. They are universal rules because they are tapping into our own universal rules about how data can be synthesized. Now Kant's great trick in the critique is that he uses logical deduction to connect those a priori intuitions to the a priori, a priori concepts. Again, I'm giving us a Coles Notes version of that very detailed deduction. But suffice it to, for us to say that it is the imagination's job to connect the pure intuitions of space and time to the pure concepts or, or categories. So just to reiterate, Kant thinks that it is the imagination that unites these two a priori sides. Here's a visual. We've got the pure intuitions of space and time on one side, and we've got the pure concepts on the other. In between, we've got our unity of apperception consciousness uniting all of this together. What is doing that uniting and synthesizing? It's the imagination. So let's say we're experiencing a necessary causal connection happening between spatiotemporal objects, which is the rule for how objects can be experienced, i.e. in 3D space and in successive unidirectional time. The mind applies its coding rules. It finds, of course at a pre or subconscious level, that it matches code 1A. It is universal. It matches code 2A. It is there as a thing that exists. When thinking specifically about the response of the green ball, it finds 3B, causal connection. And finally, it finds code 4C. It is a necessary connection, meaning it is a universal rule and not an accidental occurrence. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't make mistakes about the categories. Of course, we can interpret something as necessary when it's actually contingent. But what it means is that we don't rely on experience to make these determinations. We're instead relying on the fundamental rules that our brains follow in making sense of information we receive about the world. In other words, we do not need to experience universality to recognize or posit it. 
Instead, we're able to pick these categories out because they are part of our a priori structure that allows us to make sense of experience. The imagination has to make the synthesis, though. Recognizing something like causality means applying the rule of how objects are in space and time to the rules of how we think about things. Unlike Hume, Kant doesn't think these are disconnected. He thinks that the imagination synthesizes the a priori intuitions with the a priori concepts as part of the synthesizing unity of apperception. And the result is that we can apply the rules of thinking to the rules about how objects are experienced in space and time. Here's Kant. What we have expounded separately and individually in the previous section, i.e. pure intuitions and pure concepts, we will now represent as unified and in connection. The possibility of an experience in general and cognition of its objects rest on three subjective sources of cognition. Sense, imagination, and apperception. Each of these can be considered empirically, namely in application to the given appearances, but they are also elements or foundations a priori that make this empirical use itself possible. Sense represents the appearances empirically in perception, the imagination in association, and reproduction, and apperception in the empirical consciousness of the identity of these reproductive representations with the appearances through which they are given, hence in recognition. But pure intuition, with regard to it as representation, time, the form of inner intuition, grounds the totality of perception a priori. The pure synthesis of the imagination grounds association a priori and pure apperception, i.e. the thoroughgoing identity of oneself in all possible representations, grounds empirical consciousness a priori. Just to clarify, whenever Kant says pure, he means a priori. What he just said there in those passages is that you have three things or faculties at work at both an a priori and an a posteriori level. The a priori level, the pure intuition of space and time, the synthesizing role of the imagination, and the a priori awareness of self, all work together to make experience possible in the first place. As I said above, the a priori part of sensation is the pure intuition of space and time, which Kant says has to be coded in before you have an actual experience of objects in the world. But let, let's look now more closely at the two roles of the imagination. Today we'll just cover the a priori level of the imagination. Next video we'll cover the a posteriori role. This is the picture I gave you earlier to illustrate how Kant sees the imagination as coming in twice in perception. And we're going to now just talk about this first one, the one I have circled in red here. Kant tells us that at, a, at the a priori level, the imagination plays a productive role, while at the a posteriori level, it plays a reproductive role. As we'll see next time, the reproductive role of the imagination will not be terribly foreign to us, given what we've learned about the imagination from the other philosophers we've looked at so far. Kant's a priori imagination, though, is, of a, totally different, is a totally different beast in that it doesn't synthesize information after it has come in. Instead, we might imagine it synthesizing information on the front end. In order for the data to hit us, metaphorically I mean, it has to come in as already synthesized. This is what Kant calls the imagination's productive role, and adding it solves some problems that Locke and Hume could not. Because the mind has to take in sense data in a 4D format, meaning 3D space plus time, it doesn't actually experience things as flat even if we know that from a simple sensory perspective, 
We maybe should see them as flat. So if Locke and Hume are right, that we just take in basic simple ideas or impressions, then when I look at my printer, I should see just, I just see three sides, and I might assume, if it weren't for past experience, that I'm looking at a flat object that just has three sides. But I don't. I'm not confused that I'm looking at a cube with sides that I can't see. Locke and Hume would say that the mind connects up simple impressions or ideas and knows from past experience that there are three more unseen sides, two at the back and one underneath. But Kant disagrees. He thinks the imagination's synthesizing role already takes the object in as 4D, again meaning three, three spatial dimensions and one temporal. This isn't combined afterwards, Kant says. It's information that is synthesized from the manifold according to the pure intuitions of space and time and connected up with the concepts all already in its first instance. This is done through the imagination's productive role. Productive, I should say, not because it's invented by the imagination, as Hume might have it, Productive in the sense more like constructed through synthesis. So to re reiterate, this is where Kant is extremely different from Locke and Hume. For Kant, the a priori structure that synthesizes space-time and concepts means that the mind does not take in simple impressions and then combine them to make a complex image. Instead, the mind takes the image already as 4D. And this is how we experience the world in its first instance. It's not through reflection or through some post-experiential combining of simple impressions, but an automatic recognition. The only possible way to experience things is as four-dimensional. And that is how the information is taken in by the imagination in its first instance. This isn't passive, as in having the mind just take in sensation without having to do anything. It's active. It means that perception in its first instance is an active process that involves synthesizing information as it is coming in. Here's Kant. There is thus an active faculty of the synthesis of this manifold in us, which we call imagination, and whose action, exercised immediately upon perceptions, I call apprehension. For the imagination is to bring the manifold of intuition into a, to an image. It must therefore antecedently take up impressions into its activity, i.e. apprehend them. Apprehending there means taking in information according to those programming rules, as spatiotemporal and as propositional and conforming to the categories. Like this, the image that I showed you earlier where it's applying the spatiotemporal objects to the modes of thought. And to reiterate, Kant calls this the productive role of the imagination. Which means that, at an a priori level, or programming in our metaphor, the imagination acts ahead of sensation to automatically match up intuition to concepts. And, as I said a minute ago, this is why Kant, unlike Locke or Hume, thinks we take in information as already complex rather than a, as simple ideas that then, only after the mind has taken them up as simple ideas, combines them into complex ideas. And this solves some weirdnesses in Locke and Hume. It explains why we mix simple ideas in the way that we do, why we don't get confused about things like substance or causality, or why the red is attached to the apple without us knowing precisely what it is that's sitting behind the red. So that was the a priori role of the imagination. But the imagination's work, it doesn't end there. 
Kant also thinks the imagination has to play an a posteriori role in perception in order to mentally reproduce images in the mind. He writes, it is, however, clear that even this apprehension of the manifold alone would bring forth no image and no connection of the impressions were there not a subjective ground for calling back a perception from which the mind has passed on to another, to the succeeding ones, and thus for exhibiting entire series of perceptions i.e. a reproductive faculty of imagination, which is then also merely empirical. And this is where Kant sounds more in line with the philosophers we've studied, especially Hume, though with some important differences that come from having eliminated the need for simple ideas. But let's leave it here for today. I know Kant is intense, and I think that's just about enough information for one day. We'll keep talking about Kant's theory of the imagination in the next video. Thank you everybody for listening. There'll be another video posted in a few days that finishes the story about Kant and then leads us into a final wrap-up session about the distinction between uh, representationalism and direct realism as the theme for the course. Thank you everybody for listening. Talk to you next time.